good. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, April 11, 2018 meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. I'd like to call the meeting to order, and if you would rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Baybine? Present. Councilor Rowan? Here. Councilor Foley? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Hayes? Here. Councilor Chiazzo? Here. Chairman Donovan? Here. Uh, new business. We This is really, uh, 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 except for a, a second item that got added. This is a special meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. Our normal meetings would be the first and the third Wednesdays of the month. But uh, we concluded that we wanted to be able to have the presentation made uh, of the budget by both the town manager and the superintendent, and then uh, allow a week to go by to uh, uh, give everyone the opportunity to actually look at the budget, uh, make some judgments about it, uh, allow both the public and the town council to uh, have that opportunity uh, with the expectation that the discussion tonight would be uh, much more enriched by by that effort. So we'll see how successful this is. Uh, uh, order number 18-28, first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed municipal school budgets for the fiscal year 2019. Uh, any further introduction? I don't believe so. I, I was not planning on doing a, another presentation. Uh, I thought we covered that last week. I'm certainly pleased to answer questions from uh, the council, if they have any, um, and to the extent that there's public comment, um, I'll do my best to field those as well, if that's helpful. Sounds good. And uh, uh, we have the uh, uh, superintendent, as well as uh, looks like most of the members of the Board of Education here with us tonight, uh, uh, the business manager for the Board of Education. And so we're going to uh, uh, have a pretty open discussion. Any questions that board members have? And I've asked them to to try and uh, at least uh, consider what it is at this uh, initial juncture that they would like to uh, uh, identify as issues for them and uh, comments and questions. So we'll go from there. Why don't we start with uh, uh, public comment. Uh, anyone wanting to address the budget as it was presented last Wednesday, please approach the podium and provide us with your name and address. Thank you. I'm Susan Hamill, and I live um, at 3 Bay Street. Um, I'm just going to repeat uh, the message that I sent out to the council today. Um, basically, we, we ask a lot of the professionals who manage our town, just as we ask a lot, expect a lot from our schools, our kids, ourselves. The town council directed the town manager to bring in a budget with a tax increase no higher than 3%. Yet the budget before you tonight provides for a 4.2% tax increase. This is simply not acceptable. Please don't let our town manager off the hook on this important part of his job. With all the divisiveness in the town right now, it sure would be great to pass the budget on the first vote. But this just will not happen with a 4.2% tax increase. Please don't let the budget be the reason we go through another summer like last year. Thank you. Thank you. I am Brian Shumway from Five Memory Lane in Scarborough. Uh, I'd like the council to think about the services that get provided in the town, in the school department, and what we all expect as citizens of Scarborough, and put that ahead of a random, artificial 3% number. Um, services matter, percentages don't. Uh, focus on what we want as townspeople uh, for services. Thank you. Um, Benjamin Howard, 4 Oakdale Drive. Um, unfortunately, I haven't had a lot of time to look at the line, specific line by line items. 
Uh, as today, for some reason, the budget information wasn't online. Uh, just a couple minutes ago, uh, the new budget, joint budget website went up, and I think you guys did a great job and hit a home run there. Uh, but what I am concerned about, looking through um, some of these just quick line items that I had noticed that had been increasing fairly fast over the last couple of years, and maybe areas that we could look to cut money. Um, one, for example, was the high school guidance counselors. Um, today, we're looking for $476,000. That's up from $247,000 in 2012. It's a fairly large increase. And the other major point of, of an increase that large that I noticed quickly here is in the MIS staff department. That's the IT department. Um, in 2012, <coughs> we were only spending $86,000. And in this budget proposed here, we're about to spend $446,000. Um, there are some areas uh, that I also saw quickly um, where we are making huge cuts. So I understand that the town and school board is trying to do their best here. One example is the middle school instructional supplies. Um, that number had been increasing uh, from 30,000 in 2012 to 60,000 in 2017, uh, in which case this year we're going to cut it down to $25,000, which is a substantial cut to that particular department. Um, I do think that there has been a lot of work put in here, but I think there's a lot more work that can be done. Um, and I think overall as a whole, if we can keep looking back at history and see um, people are giving and taking here and trying to put together a budget that the town can accept and hopefully we can keep moving along in this process and, and get further on. Um, and I'll bring up more numbers as I notice them as I go along. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else wishing to speak? Paula O'Brien, 20 Pondview Drive. Um, I sent an email to the council this afternoon, and I just would like to read that for the benefit of the public, some that might not know these particular instances. Um, it's my hope that our town of Scarborough can begin to heal from all the discord that has been over the past few weeks, that a reasonable budget be put forth so that not to have multiple votes and further separation in this community I grew up in that you, the town council, will stand behind your word of a 3% or less property tax increase. Send the budgets back to the town manager and superintendent to make adjustments mm -hmm. to come in at what you requested. I'm happy that they and others can afford that, but many cannot. Social Security recipients finally received a 2% increase this year after two years of nothing. What many don't realize is that 2% is an average of less than $30 a month, the highest increase since 2012. That's six years, and this is the highest increase. And most of that is offset by Medicare costs. The average monthly Social Security check is $1,258 a month, or about $15,000 a year. That equals $288 a week, or $7.21 an hour. Could you live on that? How would you feel if you didn't get a raise for two years, and then you get a $28 a month raise, but your insurance deductible goes up by $1,000? As some of you know, I lost my dad just over a year ago. At the risk of repeating myself, and I probably will again and again until more people get it, but I'll use my parents as an example of many retired couples for a moment. When he was living, mom and dad enjoyed many retired years together. As they got older, their medical needs increased, as did their expenses. Then when one or the other of a happily married retired couple passes away, right off funeral costs are $15,000 to $18,000. So in addition to the trauma of losing one's beloved spouse of 60 plus years, the survivor has additional bills. On top of that, they lose one whole income. So when a retired couple used to live on 30,000 a year, the survivor is now living on around 15,000 a year, but all the bills are still the same, except for the increases in property taxes if they're still lucky enough to have property, and increases in Medicare and other bills the rest of us have. My mother will be just fine, my father saw to that, except for her broken heart, and believe me, it's broken. But my point is that many, many are not okay, and these annual increases are not okay. Yes, the children are our future, but our parents are our past. We owe it to take care of those that took care of us just as much. 
We owe it to our seniors, our parents, and our neighbors that are disabled and on fixed incomes to help them and control this spending. Someday we all hope to retire and children learn what they live. I hope they look out for us, for you, and maybe they'll, but maybe they'll feel their own kids matter more than their parents. This town needs to do what we all do in our budgets and make it work if the money isn't there. Then cut back and don't buy. We raised three kids with one bathroom, and while we would have loved another toilet, we couldn't afford it, so we didn't get it. And my husband works around the clock, so just imagine. And while I'd love to hire someone to mow the lawn for him, we choose to put our money towards our needs, not our wants. So I urge you, the council, to please send this budget back to the town manager and superintendent and have them find a way to be fair to everyone, to, what, to do what you requested. They work for you and all of us. Thank you. Anyone else would like to address the council on the budget? Uh, I'll accept the motion. So moved. Second. Discussion. Who would like to start us off? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll start us off. Uh, I had some questions that I wanted to ask uh, of the town manager. Uh, there are some issues that, uh, that I think are important, and it's important to, when people gather, as we have tonight, to actually hear where is the town going uh, with uh, things of importance. Uh, one of them was, uh, where, where have we where are we going with our fund balance? Because that certainly has been an issue that we've heard a lot about uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, correspondence from uh, taxpayers. And I'd like to be able to uh, uh, make sure that that's addressed tonight. Would it be easier if I spoke for the podium? Or it it would, if you would. Although I don't have uh, you know, any particulars, I can give you some gener generalities. Uh, this council uh, did receive a, a, a presentation from its auditor last month or the month before. One of the major points that they focus on uh, has to do with fund balance. That's a, a critically important thing to our financial health, frankly. Uh, I'm very proud that the town has uh, done its part uh, in terms of not using fund balance in its annual budgeting process for this will be our sixth year, I believe. Uh, and that's uh, a very conscious effort. And due to that kind of vigilance and, and discipline that we've uh, put, on, put upon ourselves, we've been able to steadily grow our fund balance. Uh, it's still at the lower end that some of our financial advisors have recommended would be um, optimal. But I think we're, uh, it's a great demonstration of uh, having a principal sticking to it and showing gains year over year. Uh, on the school side, they have historically used a level of fund balance in their annual budgeting process, ranging anywhere between three to five hundred thousand dollars, depending on the circumstances. Uh, that seems, uh, in my view, that's a totally different circumstance. In fact, uh, they are limited in any number of ways and really not carrying much fund balance. So I think it's an appropriate <coughs> use. Um, this year is a bit. Uh, the current year, fiscal year 18 that we're in, is a bit of an anomaly, as the council is well aware. Uh, there's a significant use of fund balance to help budget the, uh, balance the current budget. Uh, in 19, that goes away. And so that's one of our biggest budget challenges um, as I stand here before you. Uh, this comes as no surprise. I think everyone uh, walked into this with eyes wide open. I will credit my colleague, uh, Superintendent uh, Cooper Kuchenberger, for instituting uh, curtailments uh, this current year. Within two weeks of the budget finally being adopted, there was a curtailment order in place. She and I uh, had a similar order for the third and fourth quarter of the prior year, all of which is designed, uh, intended to prepare for this day. Clearly, we, we uh, don't have all those resources to plug that hole, if you will, and so that, that is a budget challenge this year. But I'm very pleased, and I do credit the council. It's awfully tempting and easy to go to fund balance to balance the budget. Uh, we've resisted that temptation. And I think we've been rewarded. And this council has actually raised the bar higher on itself. You've created higher benchmarks. And our goals, uh, are, all of those bars have been lifted. So um, it, create, it, it makes for a very compelling story as we sit and talk to the rating agencies. 
um, for the ever elusive uh, uh, rating, bond rating, which is really important to us. Uh, that's a critical factor, and we've been able to make a compelling argument and hold our bond rating constant, due in large part to a strong performance on fund balance. And the, the numbers of going up over the last six years, is that on a consolidated basis or just the municipality? Yeah, our fund balance, the school is technically a department of the town, so uh, we consider fund balance together, so on a consolidated basis. Uh, each year, uh, we're running annual budget surpluses, so there's, a, there's every year some level of money that ends up being fund balance. Uh, so both town and school have been in a position based on budget performance uh, to each contribute to that uh, fund balance year over year. Do you have a well, sense for Do you have a sense for how large that is on an annualized basis? That, that surplus that you're referring to. The it can fluctuate greatly. Uh, you know, the, the one on the town side, the one factor that seems to be the the thing that we uh, are underestimating in terms of revenue is our excise tax. Tax, though we've increased year over year the expectation, we've met and certainly exceeded it. And in many, in almost all years, that's been the single driving factor on the town side. On the school side, they've got a larger budget. They have a lot of different things that happen during the course of the year. After all, a budget is your best guess, um, and, then you, and then you have experience. And so through changes in uh, staff in particular, given the, the nature of their organization, uh, there can be huge fluctuations uh, really in positive budget performance by not spending as much was, uh, as was expected. Uh, they are severely limited on the revenue side, so that's not really a factor for them. If I could follow up. So this year, um, it looks like we have a, uh, we budgeted revenues of uh, 14.5 million in revenues, um, and it looks like we're projecting 15.5. It's, it's about a $1.1 $1 .1 million increase. Would you say that's unusual uh, for an increase? For, for excuse me, for the uh, exceeding the budgeted revenues? Uh, uh, it's uh, it's a bit of an anomaly, but I think each and every one of those factors that contributes to that increase uh, is well-founded, and uh, we would not be recommending that in our proposed budget if we didn't have confidence. Um, forgive me, I, I can't recall all the components that make that up, but I, I do recall uh, very carefully considering all of those revenue estimates and not wanting to be um, overly optimistic. <coughs> I see. I think, I think what I was more referring to was the fact that our, our 2018 projection, it seems to be well above the, the 2018 budget. Oh, I wasn't I looking at 2019. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that projection column, um, quite frankly, uh, we all do our best to project. We still have another quarter of experience, frankly, in this budget year. So there's, a, there's still some major things that can happen in the final quarter of the year. So uh, I don't want to say I don't have tremendous faith in that, uh, but I think uh, some of that, those projections are suspect, that uh, there's just a lot of things that can happen. Um, I can tell you that my department managers certainly know that they need to live within their means, and I fully expect that they will, in spite of what that projection might suggest. Uh, you, <clears throat> you identified a, uh, uh, an order put out by the superintendent uh, <clears throat> and yourself to control costs in light of the problems with the budget last year, was it effective? Can you speak to that? Yeah, I can't speak to the particulars if uh, <coughs> Superintendent Kuchenberger wants to. She said to walk. So the curtailment that we put into place this year, right at the start of the school year after the budget passed, um, has generated approximately $250,000 in additional fund balance that we'll be able to utilize um, during FY19. Thank you. <clears throat> Chris. So I, I'll make a comment, I guess, on fund balance first. So I, I, for those who don't know, I have the privilege of serving on the Finance Committee. It's been my third year. <laughs> <laughs> well, I say that in a kind of tongue-in-cheek because we, we have these very conversations on a regular basis. So I, I may not have a lot of uh, detailed questions because I, I trust the process. I know the process. I know how we're going to end up. Uh, in, in terms of fund balance, I will say um, I've, I've been very happy uh, through the course of the last three years where I believe, and I won't speak for everybody else on the committee, but our, a, a general goal of ours was to stop moving away from detailed annual budgets more into the philosophy and the, and the, and the long-term strategic <coughs> planning of budgets and policies. So one of my concerns about fund balance has always been 
you, you, you don't, I don't want to rob existing programming in order to build up a fund balance for a bond rating so that we can borrow more money. So we are having those discussions, but I think it's very important to kind of couch that in place with uh, balancing operational <coughs> revenues and the requirements of, of day-to-day -day operations with the ability to manage fund balance and create fund balance. There's a lot of emphasis at the local and the state level with uh, maintaining certain percentages of fund balance. I think we do a very good job of discussing the pros and cons of all of those things, and I think we balance fairly well the, the um, desire to maintain a level without detrimental, detrimentally impacting an existing program or an operational program. So having said that, though, I do have a couple questions, and I know, Tom, um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to kind of lead you a little bit with this, I guess. Uh, we've had a lot already, a lot of numbers thrown around that aren't entirely accurate, so I'd like to maybe get that on the record of what numbers we are talking about. So just so uh, we're clear, as it exists right now in its current form, the total expected net change to the tax rate is 5.32%. Is that correct? No, that, that's uh, based on expenditures. That's based on expenditures. So what is the actual impact on the tax rate of the? Uh, based on a mid-range expectation of valuation growth, it's 4.19%. Uh, 4.19%, okay. So could we as a council agree to use that number as a basis moving forward of what the projected tax rate is or in that range so that there isn't any confusion out there? Uh, I would I don't ask for I would ask if we could do that moving forward. The uh, the other question that has come up has been tax increases over time, uh, <coughs> and I will compliment Councillor Rowan for putting together a table uh, that shows that from 2008. Uh, and I would ask if we, as a council, would review that and uh, look at that as being the number, or have staff review that, so that we're all talking about the same number of increases year over year. Because I've already seen information coming out that says our taxes went up X amount last year, and I don't believe that was entirely accurate. So I'd like that if we could find a way to build that into the budget portal of the document, so that we can all agree mm. what we're talking about as a body. Uh, I, I whether that others agree or disagree with those numbers, at least we're talking from the same perspective, and we can move that conversation forward, if that's <coughs> Yes, I, I did review Council Rowan's work. I, I agree. I, I believe all, everything reflected there is accurate, and we will um, prepare that in a slightly different form and make it available on the portal. Okay, thank you. And what's important there, uh, though it may not uh, be terribly important to the taxpayer, but it, uh, I think it's an important point to make that Starting in 2015, the council set this goal of 3% of or less. And since then, um, three of the four years you've met that. And even last year, I would credit you by saying, at the time of budget adoption, you believed you were there. Uh, there were things that happened in the valuation and the final analysis, separate apart from anything that you could foresee or expected that created the tax rate and the ultimately that, that exceeded it. But, um, I think it's important to point that uh, point out that, that you believed you met your expectation um, and, and the goal you set. If I could just follow, and, and my, my goal with the 3% or less isn't a dollar value or a number. <coughs> the goal I've always approached it is increasing stability in the tax rate, predictable, sustainable, and understandable increases over time. Nobody likes to pay taxes. I don't like to pay taxes, but we have to pay for services. So I, 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 I I look at it personally as a way to stabilize the tax rate so that we can, we can do better long-term projections, we can understand revenue streams, and we don't have these giant peaks and valleys and, and, and upsets that we have to constantly react to. Don't say this. And I, I guess I'll, I'll pile on Chris and kind of lead you in a question. Um, but you did reference that we have really, really had this consistent goal as, as a council of having a predictable tax rate of 3% or whatever. And, and Tom, I think in all those years, even though we've hit that target, as you said, most of those years, last year was a year off. But it might, what might be helpful to look at the conversation, because I think I'll kind of build on it later in the evening. But I really admired the process that I think you have followed with your team and how you go about <coughs> preparing the budget. I mean, I think every year that I've been on the council, whenever we have a target, the number that you put in front of us is always at that target. There may be things in that. I know several years 
you came to us and said, here's the number, here's how I can get there, but let me tell you the things that we can't do. And in a couple of years, it really involved public safety issues. We didn't have enough staffing, and you were able to say, here's the number that you asked for, but let me tell you about the things we aren't going to be able to do or the risk we're going to have. And you actually have worked with, by the time you bring us the budget, you've really worked with your team that mm -hmm. you've kind of done a lot of the heavy lifting behind the scenes. So can you talk a little bit about that process sure. and how it's involved and how it works and how you've kind of worked with us as, as, a, as a group? Sure. And, and thank you for that recognition. Um, yeah, I really do see it as my job to, uh, to do the heavy, heavy lifting for you. It's uh, really important for me to have clear guidance. Uh, part of the challenge of guidance when it deals with tax rate is there's a number of other variables that I don't control. So um, within my universe, I try to do my part, and I certainly lean heavily on my department staff uh, to do their part, and they certainly never disappoint. And um, this year is really no different. The budget I deliver to you, I would say, and I think I've characterized it like this in the past, that um, it's really to the point of, of my level of comfort. I mean, I am tasked with the charter to propose a budget to meet the needs of uh, this community and until someone tells me that they want to change the type and the level of municipal services we provide that's that's a uh, an assumption that I make in the budget process For, from here on out um, at least from the town's perspective uh, we're looking at modifying types and maybe levels of service and I'm pleased uh, to help advise you in that regard and maybe make recommendations but quite frankly, I think that conversation need, needs to be surrounded with many voices. Uh, I, ha I have some ideas, but they're not easy choices. And it's not that I'm bashful from the conversation, but I, th I, I humbly think that others need to be part of the conversation too. So I heard from this podium, um, you know, forcing us to do our job, I really feel as though I am. And we stand, and I think I speak on behalf of Julie, we fully expect and stand ready to assist you uh, in making, identifying what those decision points are and uh, making the best choices for this community. And, and it, just to kind of a labor point, I, and I'm getting old, so I have these senior moments, so I, they, they may not be factual, it may be a, a story. Um, but, I, but I do remember one year, you delivered us a budget, but, but the, our process that we follow is then your department heads come in front of us and, and have a chance to kind of talk about what their needs might be, what some of the consequences are. And I do remember one year there were some real particular issues about needing some more police resources. Mm -hmm. And even though we knew we were at the target, I think after we had that conversation and the case was made about why this is something we should really consider, I think we went about that goal because we really felt, and it was that dialogue with communities, that those were the right things to do. It was a good investment of the town resources. But that was a very productive process, so I, I may be making up part of that story, but does that <laughs> ring a bell? No, oh, it certainly does. And, and frankly, if you look, there are exhibits that support uh, advancing a staffing plan. I've not proposed that as part of my budget, but those are conversations we'd love you to engage in. Um, I, I get the strong sense that this was not the year to advance those things, but the need exists. They only get greater, frankly. And so it's incumbent on us to, uh, as the professionals, to advise you what those needs are. Uh, it really depends how quickly we can, we can move forward. So much of that is still here. I probably didn't characterize it in much the same way in terms of unmet need, if you will. Um, but uh, as departments appear before you, I think you'll hear some of those additional investments uh, come forward. Um, can you speak at all to uh, the budgets that were delivered in um, for first reading over the last four years uh, and where they where they fell? Do you do you? recall at all if they were all at the goal that was set by the town council or did they come in uh, above that for first reading? I, I can say for certain from my perspective um, the council's goal has always been tax, tax rate focused and um, I don't believe any of them in day one started at that point and uh, I certainly appreciate where we start this conversation <coughs> is important certainly where we end it is the most important and I believe both the town and the school side have started the conversation at the best place we have in recent memory, um, from my perspective, at least during my tenure, tenure here. Um, just interestingly, and this should not surprise anyone, in all cases, I just look back over the last eight years, uh, second reading the final budget that was approved, in all cases, is less than, um, 
what we start with, and in some cases significantly less. And this is a table that I'll clean up and I'll put on the portal as well, just to appreciate that we fully expect some movement and probably some downward movement, frankly. Um, certainly we need to to meet your goal. Mm -hmm. Jean uh, Mr. Hall, could you just outline very briefly for the listening audience, um, we're going to have first hearing today, but it's my belief we have something like five weeks before we have the second hearing and what will happen in that five-week period? Certainly. So tonight, uh, April 11th, is your uh, intended to be your first reading of the budget. That will really initiate the adoption process. Uh, the budget order is no different than any other order before council. Well, I shouldn't say that. The budget order uh, does have a specific adoption process associated. So uh, much like the ordinance adoption process, it requires a first reading, a public hearing, and a second reading. In most cases, that's done in a fairly close succession. The budget is stretched over a six or seven week period, just given the, the amount of um, <coughs> Uh, detail involved. So we start tonight, uh, then we're on schedule for a public hearing on May 2nd. In the intervening weeks, both the Town Council's Finance Committee and I believe the Board of Education as well are doing their own internal budget review and will help kind of inform the conversation as uh, those discussions happen and the weeks go by. And then looking forward, we're on schedule for um, second reading on May 16th, and all of that leads up to the primary vote. Um, school validation vote on June 12th and uh, with that requirement that really is what informs the budget timeline and schedule we work backward from the date and uh, generally start around the first of April and spend the next several months uh, talking budget and a follow-up to that is so so in that intervening time um, that's when you refine this number so that hopefully we're going to get below 3% 3, 3 or less uh, as a tax rate. A, a case in point, uh, the Towns Finance Committee already had its first department uh, review. I think there was three departments they reviewed. Um, just in the time since I presented this and in that meeting, we found out the main state revenue sharing, uh, we're going to get $38,000 more than was expected. So mm -hmm. things will be mm -hmm. refined, improved as the, as the days and the weeks tick away. Um, and then certainly the, the various committees will be having their review. Uh, there may well be some changes that come. Uh, I was keeping notes the other night, and I suspect there will be some changes that come from just the first night. Mm -hmm. Is this t time for me to make a comment also? Yes. Uh, my, my comment is, and this isn't a question to, to Mr. Hall, but actually it's for the people who are concerned about the tax rate is, I'm certainly hopeful that, that when this tax rate comes in at 3% or less, that uh, those who have historically opposed uh, the taxes or the tax rate increases in town um, will stand down. Uh, and, and we'll support it because it's pretty obvious to, of course, I'm on the inside, it may not be as obvious to the public, but we work very hard uh, to maintain uh, that tax rate increase below 3%, which is not easy in the environment that we're in uh, today. So I just want to make that comment. Other questions for... I don't know if you're well, prepared to ask about... Sp I had questions about specifics. Is that Go right ahead. This is free. This I'll is it? my best. All right, I'll throw them out. <laughs> um, can you talk at all about the the bond premiums and the the bond proceeds that are in the revenue, um, both the in 2018 and 2019? Yeah, that seems to be a consistent reoccurring phenomenon. We don't when we go to sell general obligation bonds, we don't indicate that we want uh, bond premium necessarily. Um, I think with quarters here, it seems that is a standard course of action now. When we receive bids back through a competitive bid process, bid premium is a component. And I don't profess to understand why it's of value to the investor, to the bond, uh, bond buyer, but bid pre premium seems to be the new normal. And so in this current uh, year, we have $762,000 in new debt service, predominantly <coughs> from the voter-approved public safety building and some other uh, capital improvement borrowing. Um, but there was uh, about $500,000 in bid premium that's included as a revenue to help off, and the only thing it can be used for is for debt-related expenses. Is that helpful? Yeah, um, so that's in the 2019 budget. Do you, can you speak at all to the 672 that's in the 2018 projection? I assume that that's come in. 
that number is fairly specific. I assume it's based on. Yeah, I think that's an actual amount of bid premium that, uh, that we received, received this year. Yeah, I don't recall the particulars. I, I do the 19 just because we did the borrowing six weeks ago. Gotcha. Um, and then the other one that I was curious about on the, uh, in the revenue side, can you talk at all about the, the salary reimbursement in uh, the, uh, the MIS, the Management Information System? It just struck me as odd. Sure. Um, Julie may be better able to answer that, but essentially there are three employees on the school side paid entirely by the school. I believe they're categorized as uh, uh, ed techs that have assumed uh, these te technology responsibilities. As I understand it, they also have other responsibilities, including uh, bus duty, lunch duty, you know, all sorts of other things that occupy their time. They also work the school schedule, so they're not here uh, year-round. Uh, we're proposing to convert those three employees to town employees, and there's an offsetting revenue from the school to support that cost. Uh, we expect we'll get great gains in productivity because of just the fact that they'll be here year-round and uh, not have other distractions to their time. So we think it's going to be a huge gain. And uh, uh, Jen Day uh, from the IT department can certainly speak to the exponential growth of responsibilities of IT with mm -hmm. Uh, just the number of devices that uh, they're managing is uh, quite a chore. Mm. The other part of this is we're um, moving away from use of summer staff. We've historically used five to seven mostly high school students uh, to help us do a lot of the school-related re-imaging of computers. Mm. Uh, those um, summer staff will go away because we'll now have uh, three full-time year-round staff. And so then, if I'm understanding correctly, then that this that whole line, the salary reimbursement, shows up as a uh, on the school budget as an expense. Correct. Got it. And there's a detailed spreadsheet that shows that allocation of cost. Um, sounds like the finance committee would like us to do a similar allocation for other town departments, which uh, we're prepared to undertake. Thank you. We had a, uh, uh, a question from uh, one citizen <clears throat> saying they couldn't find the portal on the uh, town's website. Uh, and it was just a little difficult to find, but uh, uh, we immediately put a large little, uh, uh, right on the homepage, upper right-hand corner, uh, to indicate that it's, uh, it's there. It's kind of on the left-hand margin also, but you're seeing town council, rules and policies, ordinances, so it kind of got lost in there. So, uh, but we're trying to populate that site with everything we have, and, <coughs> and it's, it's, it's well presented by sections, but then if you really want to dig down and see every line item, the, the last two tabs, I think, are... Uh, our, uh, every single light item for the budget. So Yes, we are committed, both town and school, to really being diligent throughout this process to keep putting more materials up there. That uh, ends up being a challenge as more stuff is produced. Uh, but with the redesign of the portal, we hope that the organization and the layout it makes it much far easier to navigate. In the past, I think there's been legitimate criticisms that it's really hard to find what you're looking for. So we're hopeful that the new format, if not, we would be very interested in feedback. Uh, also, we have some extra copies at Colette's desk so that if people want to come in and just sit in uh, the conference chambers uh, and, and really go through it because they like paper. Uh, do we also have some at uh, the library? Yes. Thank you, Nancy. Yes. Yeah, great. Yep. Uh, I did have another uh, question uh, asked of me, and that was uh, looking, for, looking for large items. And there was a uh, inclusion of the residential revaluation that we've talked about uh, as an appropriation uh, item, not a capital item, even though it's a one-shot deal. We don't do it for another 10, 12 years. And I thought you could speak to that. Certainly. Yes, I'm, uh, you know, I, I appeared before this council six weeks ago and uh, requested funding to move forward on the commercial industrial reval. And my argument was based on just the sheer equity of making sure our values are as close to 100% as the law requires as possible. I, I think that's a strong argument. And so we certainly can't have one without the other. So the other part, which is about 80% of our value, is residential value. So um, I think it's vitally important that we follow as swiftly as possible with the residential component as well. 
uh, there appeared to be uniform consensus on that point. And so as part of the budget proposal, I uh, included the full cost of the residential revaluation and through appropriation, not through any kind of financing. Uh, that alone is a $415,000 cost um, that uh, certainly is challenges our bottom line. But um, it's a great example of a priority that has been expressed. And I hope we stick to our principles and find a way to stay on schedule. And people have said, said, you know, the town manager did a really good job of getting the budget under a 3% tax impact. But there were some real burdens here, the bond, uh, the bond debt obligation from the municipal uh, public safety building is substantial. Uh, this uh, residential reval, uh, which we are expensing, not capitalizing. It's not, so we're not going to mortgage it with a bond. We're going to pay for it in one year. Uh, and that's no small task to still come in at the level that uh, the town managers come in. Uh, uh, I would also say on the school side, uh, we've not ever had in recent years that I remember uh, a year-over-year -year cost increase that was started out at below 3%. Uh, that is a remarkable task, and I think the only other budget that was in the same area was last year's budget. Uh, so uh, when I look at this, and I get, we all get a lot of input from the community, uh, and, and we read them and reflect on them, uh, I wanted to be able to say those are big accomplishments. We haven't finished yet. We've got a long way to go, but, but they are big accomplishments. Other questions that people might have of Tom. Uh, can you give us a rough timetable on the partial revaluation? Uh, when do you expect actually to uh, have some sense of, uh, of where we will be? Uh, uh, it won't be finalized until probably leading up to the commitment uh, midsummer, you know, in final form. But I, I expect by the end of your process. Uh, approaching your second and final reading, we certainly will have completed all the field work, and I think we'll we'll have a, a, a pretty good sense, as you say, such that we could model um, what it means to the total valuation gain uh, with some level of confidence. We may want to be conservative. Um, I can speak to it better as we get there. But this week they started the field work, and uh, they have dedicated staff that will continue to work uh, diligently throughout the town. So uh, I, we're right on track and on schedule. Where do we stand with the software that's necessary to coordinate? That's going, uh, it's a concurrent project uh, that's moving to a vision-based, uh, that's the software name, uh, mm -hmm. software. And uh, that conversion uh, is happening as we speak. And I, it needs to be done in advance of new values, even the commercial industrial being put in. So uh, within the month, that will be complete. Okay. Um, this is our second year of minimum receiver status. Yes. Uh, can you speak to, I, mean, I think the town is anxious to, we've had pretty consistent tax impacts for the last four years. We will have a consistent low tax impact this year, hell or high water, we will get there. Uh, what does minimum receiver allow us to do in terms of the predictability of budgeting. Good. I'm, I'm glad you didn't ask me a more detailed question about minimum receivership because I'm not qualified to answer it. But from my perspective, perspective, uh, it adds a, a degree of uh, a great degree of predictability. Uh, I guess that's the silver lining in this what has been a dark cloud. Um, year over year, we seem to be taking huge hits, uh, very unpredictably, um, from um, you know, loss of state aid to education. Now that we've bottomed out, essentially, um, they can't take any more away from us. So uh, I've characterized this as kind of a correction year. Um, last year, we, we moved to minimal receiver. This year, we're going to wean ourselves off the use of fund balance. Uh, that suggests to me that things will be far more predictable going forward. And then when you couple that with what appears to be very robust growth in our local economy, um, just historical background growth, um, we can expect will continue at historical levels. And Scarborough Downs, uh, I think, is, is a bit of a, a wild card in that, uh, in a good way, mind you. 
Um, so I, I'm really bullish on our local economy and our ability um, uh, to gain to, to grow our tax base at the same time. Yeah, I, I, I mentioned that uh, uh, for those who haven't been out behind uh, golf and ski, the uh, project, Gateway Commons project, is fully underway. And the way the town deals with uh, uh, the value, the property value in the town, it's effective as of April 1 of each year. Uh, so we have come and gone uh, for April 1 of this year. And what they have is they've moved a lot of dirt around. Uh, but a year from now, uh, there will be an enormous additional value in just one project. So when uh, town manager says he's got some confidence in our future, uh, he does it with the knowledge that we have, uh, we have some things that are very active in the community. Uh, could I, could I ask on. one more question that occurred to me? Um, so we saw expenses this year impacted by the debt service for the new public safety building. Um, presumably that's not the full impact of the, the, the <coughs> annual cost of that. Um, those bonds, do you, do you have an idea for how much more on an annual basis we we're likely to? Uh, no, I think I think our current debt service is probably fairly consistent over the term of the of the the bond. We won't have the bond premium next next year necessarily offset, but I think in the eight hundred thousand dollar range, as I recall, that's pretty consistent over the entire term. We try to be as consistent as possible. Uh, so my recollection is that we didn't borrow the full. Oh, I think authorized. Right. Yeah, the, the voters authorized 19.5 million. We only borrowed 15 million in the first year. Uh, we'll be far more knowledgeable what the final need is this time next year. So there will be some additional borrowing. Um, I guess I don't want to promise that we won't borrow all of it, but we're only going to borrow what we need. Um, one of the things uh, in the balance is the sale of the current public safety building. If we're able to yield more than we expected, that will be less we have to borrow. Um, so. We shall see. Uh, again, a year from now, we'll be far more knowledgeable what the final need is. Thank you. I guess I'd like to be able to uh, let every council member, before we uh, conclude the discussion, at least have an opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Town Manager. Well, Chris, why don't we just start down with you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I appreciate a lot of the comments we've been getting about uh, concerns that the, the goal hasn't been met and uh, we, we ought to not pass the budget on the first reading. Um, I, I understand why that feeling is there. I just don't know the benefit of voting down a budget and ending the process <laughs> before we even really start it. My concern with doing that would also be, I, I think to the town manager's point, we, we need to have an open and public discussion with lots of input about what's going to be taken out of this budget. Because if, it's, if we dictate it now, we may not have control over what's taken out of that. And we're left to then hope that uh, the department heads align with the needs of our community or what we think our needs are. So I, I, I think the process needs to move forward. Uh, I think we're, we're, we've got five or six more finance meetings, I think. We've got at least, I know, one joint finance meeting with the school board. Um, we're all accessible and available for questions. Staff is available for questions. Uh, I think we're, you know, nothing's happening in, 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 in a closed door environment, if you will. All the debates are open and public, so uh, I, I think we need to just move the process forward. I'm, I'm firmly convinced that uh, we will not end up at 4.19, uh, which is where we started at. Uh, I know that for a fact because I know um, I'm fairly confident that our finance committee isn't going to allow that, and I, I, I'm sure working with the, the school board will, again, like we did last year, come up with a, an agreement and a compromise that's best for the town, not just for the schools or the municipal, but best for everybody. So I, I, I think we should move the process forward and, and uh, you know, the work begins. So. Thank you. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I, I guess for me this is just a you know, kind of a really, really tough struggle, kind of a challenging thing. I think I remind all of us, we were all pretty committed um, that it was going to, we knew this was going to be a tough year. We committed to a 3% goal. We also, and I really want to stress this, we all recognized 
that we wanted to pass the budget on the third time going having the budget debate go on through the summer first but, time. You said third time. First time. I was a 40 and slip. <laughs> that's where we did. First, Sorry. First, first time. <laughs> because we do recognize that well, the process we have gone through, I think it's seven out of 12 times the budgets fail. And it just puts the community through all sorts of stress during the summer. And it really impacts community relations and other things. So I really struggle. And I, I didn't, but the question that I asked the town manager earlier, we, we have been working the last couple years the joint finance committees have been really working together, really trying to find a different way that we can approach the budget. We actually met during the year to try to address some of the issues that were ongoing. One thing we did talk about this year is saying, geez, we'd really like to have a different process. And I, I love the quote by Einstein that says, you know, the, you know, doing the, uh, you know, insanity is defined by doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different outcome. And I think that's where we've been kind of in this cycle. And we're starting that cycle right now. As Chris has alluded to already, I've noticed in the last week, the dialogue is really changing in our community. They're, they're, they're really, whether it's social media or whatever it may be, it's changing. So we, I thought we had really talked about as, as a group, as, as a joint finance committee and as the town manager and the superintendent and all of us, I thought we were going to start the process is to come in with a 3% budget and be able to put on the table so, as Tom had described, we need everybody's voice on what it is we need to do as a community. We need to make choices. We've talked about this for three or four years now about tough choices. But what, what, I, what I hoped we were going to be able to do is say, here is a 3% budget, but here are the things we cannot do or will not do. And have everybody talk about it. And I'll give you a good example. And Tom mentioned it last night. We started the process last night with the, with the town budget. And I'm going to use two examples that it's just, it just stuck in my mind because it's something that's really close to me. Last night we had a conversation around the community for many seasons now have been using organics. And what we've learned each year as it goes on, the problem with organics appears to be is every year we're having to use more and more labor because the organics just aren't as effective. We're hand weeding gardens, we're hand weeding the fields, we're doing grub control and other things. You know, being green is really important. Um, we're using a lot more water. I guess there was, what was the hit last time that you described? A $36,000 hit for water and sewage usage or something that we got it's hit with? significant, I don't recall. It, it was a big number. Yes. But so mm -hmm. as a community, it really is a conversation. So, you know, is organics as important as teachers in the classroom to us as a community? And I'm not coming down on either side, but those are the types of conversations we need to have as a community is if we have finite resources, what is the highest and best use? So I'd love to find a way we can have that conversation over the next, as Chris suggests, in the next several weeks. And I'd really like to, and I think we asked this question, I asked this question last week, can we, can we I guess it will be an ask of the town manager and superintendent, come to us and, and give us your recommendations or identify for us what it would take to get to 3%, and then let's have that community conversation about what are the right things to do. I use that example of, the, of the, what we had done with the police force. If we make that case and everybody hears the compelling reasons why we should do things, everybody should have a say and that's where we should get to. So that's what I really, really ask for. I think it's to kind of come together. How do we do that? I hope we can get there, and as, as it was discussed, we've done it every other year, I am just sensitive to we're starting from a much different place this year. I think there's, as everybody knows, it's been, it's been a rough 12 months in the community. So that's where I am, and I'm, I'm going to really struggle with what to do tonight. Councilor Ketterman. Yeah, um, if this were the final vote on the budget, I would be voting no, but it's not. Um, as I asked uh, Mr. Hall to delineate, uh, the final votes aren't until May. I am confident in the... Um, work of the finance committees, both the school and the town, that they will get us to 3% or below uh, for an increase. I mean, in an ideal world, it'd be great to have no increase, but the reality is that's not going to happen. Uh, and to think that's going to happen is unrealistic, totally unrealistic. Um, so uh, I will say right now, I agree with Mr. Caiazzo's comments. Uh, Peter makes some, Mr. Hayes makes some good points also, um, but tonight I will be voting yes to move this forward because this is the beginning of the, the process to finally put together a final number uh, for a tax increase and 
I, I again, wouldn't, wouldn't support a final number that has an increase of more than 3%. But tonight I'll vote yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I had to, uh, after first pass of the budget, what I would say is there's nothing, uh, Tom and Julie no doubt did a very good job getting as lean as they felt they could get. Um, I am very curious to know what the next level would look like. I think that is an important piece and it's a part of the conversation that we have to have. Um, that said, there was a quote that I was at a training on Tuesday and the quote, uh, we were talking about time efficiency and, and how we uh, fill our days in, in the work life. And the quote was, all work expands to fill the time allowed. And I feel like uh, the way I, I've been thinking about it recently and how it applies to the budget is the same thing is true. We, we every year have gotten where we wanted to be, where, our, well, not every year, obviously, um, but many years we have started higher uh, and then hit where we wanted to be. And when I think about setting goals, I think something that's equally important is let's hit the goal and then exceed the goal. Like when I was a classroom teacher, that's what I wanted for my students. I set the bar really high because I knew if I set the bar high, they were gonna reach even higher. So I struggle sometimes, I guess, with the idea of, and I do feel, I mean, 1.2% or whatever it is, we're, I feel very confident we're going to get there. On the other hand, I'm very sensitive to what's been happening in the community the past couple of months. Um, it is a level of uh, discord and contentiousness that I have never experienced. Um, and I feel like it's unfair to put anything forth that is going to end up in a, in a battle. Uh, again, I want us to get to a place where we're going to pass it on the first time. Um, and I don't think 3% for me anyway was arbitrary, I think, or, or random. Um, for me, it was tolerable. Uh, I think there are many in this room who would say 3% is absolutely unsustainable year after year. And then there are others who would say, you know, 5% is fine or 2%. So I, I don't know that we have a number. I think 3% was something that we have found to be tolerable and predictable. And uh, so that's kind of where I am at. Um, I really appreciated what Councilor Chiazzo said earlier about agreement on numbers. I know that has been a super contentious piece in the past. Um, so I appreciate that and I will use that number. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I, I guess overall that's that's where I'm at I, I would like to see us trying to exceed the goal not just meet the goal uh, and I do feel confident that we'll get there I'm having a hard time supporting it tonight thank you Councilor Rowan um, so regarding my vote um, I I just don't believe that voting down the budget tonight gets us anywhere other than it would is necessarily productive I don't think it's going to influence the outcome of the vote in June um, but I think what it does do is it compresses our calendar because uh, what it means is that we then have to find, you know, the, the budget has to go back. We then have to have another first reading um, because we have to we have to do a budget and we're going to have that obligation. Um, the finance committee has the ability to ask the managers to make recommendations in terms of what they can um, what can be cut so that we can we can get to the uh, three percent goal. Um, uh, and then also have the ability to interrogate the, the depart various departments about whether their um, you know appropriations requests for capital equipment and capital projects are appropriate. Um, you know we, we while we haven't made use of um, uh, excuse me um, I'm, I'm blanking but we haven't made use of uh, fund balance um, this year's projection uh, in 2018. And I'm not proposing that we do make use of it. I'd just like to point out that this year's projection for 2018 is $1.1 million than what we budgeted for um, for revenues. Um, last year, we used $2.1 million in, in bond fund on the school side. This year, I didn't see the line item, but there, there's some more historical level that they're using. Even if we were just bridging that gap with some percentage of that fund, we would be that surplus. Um, unanticipated, unbudgeted revenue surplus, uh, we would be um, closing that gap. I'm not proposing that we do that. I'm saying it's an option that we have and should be discussed in, in, uh, in the Finance Committee. 
Um, when I do the number of um, where the tax rate needs to be to be 3%, currently we're at $16.49 uh, in terms of our mill rate. In order to get a 3% increase would be um, 49 cents, uh, which would take us to $16.98. Um, looking at, use, again, using our midpoint and evaluation growth, that means we're about $750,000 shy um, that we need to come up with in either spending cuts, additional revenue, in order to do it, um, you know, val uh, or you know, we have to use a different valuation number in order to get there. We'd have to use something about $44 million higher or some combination of the two. Um, um, what I would say is that this is the best starting point we've had in, in mm -hmm. uh, since I've been on the council and since uh, I've been paying attention to the to the town budget process and you know the last four years uh, we have seen um, what has come out between first reading and second reading it is all it's tightened up we've made hard choices um, and we've gotten to below the number last year we had the you know historically low increase in our valuation, which unfortunately put us over that 3% goal. Um, but um, uh, but we, you know, we're three out of four, we're averaging under three. Um, I think that 3% number is incredibly important uh, because it, um, it works toward the stability in the tax rate. I think if we, if we make short-term decisions and we really try and squeeze down around the tax rate to make a, a lower value and we don't pay attention to the fact that there is real municipal inflation that is different than consumer uh, price inflation, um, specifically because the, the labor costs in town and school is such a large percentage of those budgets, um, I don't think we can, we can ignore that. So I think that while I agree with the sentiment that it, you know, I hate to see tax rates continue to go up, I hate to see them go up as high as they are, I understand that other people would prefer that, they, uh, that we use a lower number as our target. Um, I just don't think that that's realistic. When you look historically at the numbers that I shared with you this morning, you know, we, there was an attempt made um, <clears throat> in the uh, late aughts uh, around trying to keep that, hold that number down to zero one year. In 2010, they, they did a zero base, no tax increase. <coughs> and the effect of that was you saw over the next couple of years, you saw some real large numbers that, that came out. Um, and uh, uh, so I think that the 3% target is, is reasonable. I think we can reach that this year. Um, and I'm going to be supporting tonight because I, I just don't see the, um, the efficacy or the, the benefit of voting this budget down. The great part of going last is that I agree with every single one of you. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is that we all express a different opinion or at least a variation of that opinion that truly is the same struggle that every citizen has in understanding what this budget includes, let alone what it also excludes. Um, I think the first part, I, I want to, you know, we've already started receiving comments, a ton of emails, I've received a couple of calls. Public comments are always very important, not only here but also at the school board and, and what level services are. It is a tough, it is a tough struggle. Um, there's areas of the budget um, that we are all uncomfortable with and it's not just um, the school department. Um, I'm going to target something I've been targeting since the first day I started on this council 18, 15 years ago and it's the community services budget. Um, the increase in revenues is lower than the increase in expenditures and while I understand the philosophy that there are some fixed costs that some people believe fees should not pay for, I disagree with that. It is an enterprise account that should and could pay for itself. We make money from that account. 33% of that revenue increase is coming from beach access fees increases, but yet there's no increases in um, uh, daycare that is provided, which some argue that shouldn't be a function of town government, um, as well as summer programs. Um, so I think that there needs to be a serious um, discussion. I know the Finance Committee did talk about that because there was the presentation, so I will watch it. I know that you guys protected me and did bring it up because you knew it would be, <laughs> so I appreciate that. And so we all can have that point of reference about um, you know, what we want and where we want to go. I do want to also um, suggest a couple of um, things. First is that as part of the conversation, we also set a new policy in place that said based on the tax assessed value, we've established what we will call an optimistic range 
worst case scenario, and then a mid-range. And the purpose of that was to actually balance the conversation, balance the rhetoric, and to be able to understand that there is some unpredictability that we simply don't know, not just about state funding, but it's also about where is our assessed valuation going to come from. And that's used to really to some acceptance. And this year it is a little bit different because we're going through the revaluation, and we wanted to make sure that we talked about the core numbers. Um, so, you know, I can't commit to the 4.2% only because the optimistic range is 3.5%, or I think it was 3.56, to be honest. Um, but then again, we, last year, we ended up in the worst case scenario because of the unpredictability of state funding. The fact is that the reaction of this budget, or the purpose of this budget this year, is a result, a direct result of the legislature failing to do their job and keeping their promise. We are the third largest economy in Cumberland County, we're the fifth in Cumberland and York, and we're the ninth largest contributor to the state economy, but yet we get very little funding from the state. That is not fair. Period. I don't care whether you believe me, whether you believe in what I believe, but the fact that is the fact. We get very little, especially when it comes to education, let alone main revenue sharing and other considerations. What I did want to ask is part of the presentation, and I am reserved about the school budget and where they should be, um, only because they haven't presented to us yet. I do want to ask one question, I think, and I want to make sure that it's not received in an adversarial way. But I'm going to restate what a counselor asked, um, and, and basically what I think is um, the core of the question. There was a conversation about the town, how it developed its budget, that it was below 3%, but then we come back and say, what can we add to it for what we need because we're below 3 I think the question really is, why is the school's budget budgeted at greater than 3% and then we have to advocate maybe to reduce that? And I want to get to the issue about level services and the impact that that has when you start reducing those services because I think that every department and not just the schools, they have a responsibility to tell us what we need to maintain our services in a community that's losing its funding. So if that can be part of the presentation, I think it's a very core part of the, the animosity I think that some people have towards the school budget and how it's planned. So with that, I'm, uh, you know, the last part of this is that we have a charter requirement. There's a timeline requirement that we must meet. This fits into the timeline perfectly as a result. Stopping this ends that requirement. I think that it actually violates our responsibility of, of making sure we do our job and I do not support stopping that process. We have a responsibility and it needs to move forward. Thank you. Uh, I agree with a lot of what the counselors say. I won't repeat it. Um, I was responding to a citizen's uh, email today. We've got a lot of them. Uh, and, and the question of, of well, are we, are we taxing people out? And he was making a reference to the fact that maybe he made a wrong decision in coming to Scarborough. And I was pointing out that we had, he, he came about four years ago. And I was pointing out, we've had a very stable and very predictable and very reasonably low tax rate those four years. And then it reminded me, and so I went and I looked up the data, Scarborough, is, is Scarborough over its history of municipal tax, school and, and municipal tax, uh, overtaxing its population? And there it was again. Uh, Scarborough and Falmouth have by far the lowest tax rates uh, in the region. And you can look at Cumberland, Yarmouth, North Yarmouth, Portland, South Portland, Cape, Biddeford, Westbrook. They all have higher and in many cases substantially higher tax rates. And, and our property values are up. So, I mean, this is uh, on par with those communities. So it's an apples to apples comparison. So you should realize there has not been any heavy-handed taxation of Scarborough residents uh, over the years. Um, I will say, and I had a, I, as we were going through the evening, I was just some comment reminded me of, of uh, a conversation I had four or five years ago. It was uh, Jessica Holbrook was the chair at the time. And we had an, another tough budget, mm. uh, and it was a struggle. And I had just started uh, and really didn't know as much as I should have known to be a counselor, <laughs> but, but I was. Uh, and one of the things that I had run on was, let's have stable, predictable, affordable tax rates. And she was calling me up, and she was saying, listen, you got to cooperate here. We're trying to make a compromise to reach an outcome. And I said, 
and I remember it because she teases me about it. I said, I'll, I'll compromise uh, to any degree as long as it has a two before the percentage sign. So you can put a 2.5, you can put a 2.7, you can put a 2.99, but I'm not voting for the budget unless it's below 3%. And I would make that commitment again tonight. I, uh, uh, there's a lot that's going to happen, including up until August, when we will have uh, the final uh, commitment and the real, the real tax rate gets set. Uh, and hopefully we'll have some better information on things like the revaluation, so that we'll actually know what, what, this, what this tax rate uh, is, because we have a school that has a low year-over-year -year cost increase, and they even started last year to tighten their belts. They've really been responsible in that respect. Uh, we have a town manager who's delivered us good budgets for the last six, seven years in a row. Uh, one after another. So uh, I feel pretty confident that our, the administration of our town is doing a good job. And I will make the same commitment that I made to uh, 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 four or five years ago. Uh, I'm not going to vote for a budget unless I know at the end of the day it's below 3%. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll move the process along tonight for all the reasons that were, were stated. but. Uh, that, that is my, my commitment to myself. And, uh, uh, and I was glad to hear others share the same sense of commitment. So with that, uh, any further comments or discussion? Ready to vote? All in favor? Opposed? Five to two. The first reading passes, and it will move to a public hearing. Uh, that is the last uh, item on the agenda, except for Order 18-29, act on the request from the town clerk to accept the certification of sufficiency and validity of recall petitions and schedule three public hearings for Wednesday, April 25th, 2018, pursuant to Section 906.1 of the town charter, and I'll ask the town clerk to uh, speak to the... Uh, as, note, as noted in the memo that uh, went out in the packet, uh, this is a formality from uh, the Charter, and I'm requesting that you approve the certification and sufficiency and validity of the uh, results of the petitions and schedule the public hearings. Thank you. And uh, uh, we are having three public hearings. There are three people for whom recall petitions uh, had signatures returned, and so we will hold them on the same night for practicality and efficiency and not uh, uh, intruding into people's lives who have a strong interest in this, uh, but uh, for whom it would be a potential hardship to come out three, uh, three different nights. Uh, and we will uh, hold, but we will hold them separately. So there has the potential for some redundancy, but I think uh, uh, people are pretty savvy about knowing uh, whether they need to get up uh, and speak a second or a third time. So uh, with that, I will open it up to public comment. Anyone wishing to address this uh, item on the agenda, please approach the podium. I'm Jerry Gerhardt. 30 Minute Man Drive, and I am so disappointed in this town, tremendously. I'm tired of the lies, the deceit, he said, she said, I heard. As of right now, John and I, who have lived in this town for 25 years, we are going to stand behind the school board. We're going to stand behind with all the foolishness of the superintendent gyrating on a man's crotch in the old port. We're gonna stand behind the fact that she's got pictures of fires. This isn't this town. This is a bunch of hatred and putrid and a bunch of gutter sniping. And there's a group of us who see through this. 
and I'm very disturbed. And until this town comes together, I don't know how many rocket scientists we have in this town who can sit and go through a $42, $43 million budget. This isn't let's make a deal if we keep a principal on for another year. We're going to rescind $31,3200. we are not let's make a deal here. It's not the way I've run my life. That's not the way I, I want this town to be run. So we're going to stand where we are. And I think there's legal ramifications, there's financial responsibilities here. And here we're talking about budgets and we're putting on more voters uh, with, with uh, issues concerning how much it's going to cost to do this and do that. This has got to stop. So at 30 minute and drive, and the people that I have talked with, we're going to stop this. It's going to stop one way or the other. This hatred and all this decisiveness and so forth needs to stop. Now, if we have anybody here that has better opportunities to get rid of three people here, plus a superintendent that came here 22 months ago, so all of a sudden she's got a hard one, she's going to fire this one and that one and the other. I don't believe that. Now, I ask, as a gay man, I voted for the budget down every time, two, Three, I don't have kids in the school system, and I don't agree with the grading system. I don't agree with several other things. I asked for 10 minutes of her time. I was told point blank, here are two dates. Can you make it? Would you prefer to have a phone call? No, I want to talk to you personally. And this was six weeks ago, before all this foolishness started. She didn't give me 10 minutes. She gave me an hour and 35 minutes. And who was with, with me was Mrs. Terry Crosby, who owns Crosby and Neal Funeral Homes. With that, they're in three different locations. They pay more taxes to the schools, and neither she nor Michael have kids in the school system. So she heard the same conversation. So this foolishness needs to stop. As of this point, it will be interesting to see who actually will vote, because they didn't know what they were voting for to begin with. Now we have a death in this school system. That has not really been addressed between principal, between the counselors. We need to figure out some things. I want, to think, I want things to go as normal as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address this issue before the town council, please approach the podium. Hi, I'm Lisa Douglas. Um, I live at Des Fosses Road here in Scarborough. Um, I'm also a Scarborough teacher, so I'll put that right out there. Um, for 18 years now, I have stood in front of you, commenting pro our kids, um, complimenting you for all the support that you have given. But most importantly, my crux of everything I do is thanks to the people that sit on the board and the people that govern at the head. Um, our school district has worked very hard to push forward in the things that we sought fit, that we sought counsel to others um, across the country to say what's best for kids. It's always been what is best for kids. And there's not a person sitting in front of me here, in front of this school board, or it, part of the school board, or the superintendency, that hasn't done that in every move they have made. Are these people perfect? No, am I? Are you? Are you? No. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to do the best we doggone well can. But the charge that we've been given is to do due diligence, do the research, back it, check it, and let's go forward and do the best we can. To undermine, to discredit people in the way that has been happening over the past two weeks is disgusting. I've had some questions in my classroom come forth to me that I've done a very fast dance step and sidetracked. I don't want to be doing that. And I'm teaching kindergarten folks. What model are we setting? We need to take a look at that. We need to do what's best by kids, always. That's got to be the first question. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Discussion. Motion. Motion. Accept the motion, please. So moved. Second. Discussion. How's the case? Um, good. I, I, I want to point out something that I think is very important here. Words definitely matter. Um, what we are voting on here is the certification of sufficiency and validity of the petitions. Nothing more, nothing less. We're not picking who's right, who's wrong. We're not saying that we support one side or the other. Um, I have my personal opinions, and I'm very happy to share them with anybody that wants to listen. I will not do it behind this, this microphone. Uh, however, I do have an obligation as a counselor to uphold the charter. I took an oath to do that. Uh, and that precludes my action with this process. Um, but I want to be very clear to everybody in this room, everybody in this town, and anybody else that's going to listen. My vote tonight is in no way, in any way, shape, or form, supporting what I feel is a gross misuse of the recall process. So let me be clear. I will vote yes tonight because I'm obligated to do it. Because all we're doing is ensuring and, and voting that the town clerk did her job. And she did. The people wanted a vote. You got it, folks. I certainly hope that the people who were as adamant about pushing this issue forward are equally as adamant about being part of the solution. Because I haven't heard that yet. And I'm still waiting. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Councilor Caterina. Um, yeah, I, I, I was pretty clear from the very beginning of this whole process that I thought it was a misuse of the recall provision. Uh, I agree with Mr. Cayazzo that the vote we take tonight in no way indicates one way or the other. All we're doing is certifying the vote, but I, I've, I've just, I'm so disappointed in this town. I don't, I don't get it, but that's where I am. Other? I think Councilor Chiazzo sums up what I think all of us are feeling, so I appreciate him taking the first step. I do want to suggest as well, not to kind of go back on history, but having served the longest than anyone, I have served with a total of 27 different people, both on the school board and the town council, and I have never seen one of them, even the ones who I don't agree with a word that comes out of their mouth, to have the same characteristics as what's being claimed in this recall vote. Not one of them. Even though I had philosophical and fundamental and principal differences. So I think as part of the solution, people need to step forward and also offer to run, because mm -hmm. I haven't heard that either. Yeah. I'll say this. Yeah, just to take a different tone, I think we are obligated to vote. What I will make an appeal for, and I think we've talked about it this evening, I am really distressed about where we find ourselves as a community, as a town. Um, I think all of us need to think about what is our pathway forward that we never get to a place like this again? How can we have civil and respectful conversations in our community where we can exchange viewpoints and not have it end up being in a place like this? So I, I really appeal um, we need someone to convene, some leadership to step forward to say, how do we heal and lead this community forward? Because I've been in this community 18, 19 years, I think. Councilor Foley made reference to it. I've never seen a community so divided, so divisive. You can't even have civil conversations on social media or in other places. So we have a lot of heavy lifting to do. Thank you. Councilor Foley. Um, I wasn't going to make much comment on this topic tonight, um, but I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a slow processor, so I apologize for that. Uh, I feel, I guess, a little differently, uh, and I'm going to do something I didn't know that I would do, but I, I stand behind. I actually signed the petition. I shared that with the superintendent, and I shared with her my reasoning why. Um, 
I was told uh, when I was involved in a, in a it, was, it wasn't a recall of an elected official, but it was a recall of uh, council action. Uh, many of the same words came thrown at me that I was misusing uh, the process that we have. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling because uh, I guess I need to process what it means to misuse that process. I, I think it's important that that process is available. Uh, does that mean I'm going to vote one way or another? I haven't decided that yet, to be honest with you. Uh, and that's what I told the person who asked for my signature. I do believe in the process and I do understand what it feels like to be backed up to a wall and feel like you don't have another choice. Uh, I'm sorry it came to that. I do think as a community we need to find a better way to communicate and work together. Um, every time you have to be right, you have to make someone wrong. And in that case, nobody wins. So um, I'm obviously going to support uh, the petition certification of the numbers. That's just a, a matter of uh, policy. Uh, my personal opinions are my personal opinions, and I'm happy to discuss those as well. Um, I am, I've seen disheartening pieces on both sides of this issue, and, and that's the part that tears me apart, and I, that's the part I want to see stop in our community. I don't have all the answers, but um, I have observed it and experienced it myself. So, um, like I said, that's where I'm, I'm at. Other comments? Council Ron. Yeah, uh, just clarification. The, the vote tonight, to be clear, is just to say that we're accepting the certification of sufficiency and validation of petition, recall petitions, and schedule the hearing. Correct. And the town clerk has asserted that the the, the, that the numbers are Proper correct. Numbers, that you did, signatures you did the count. were identified. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's going to be at six o'clock uh, on uh, April twenty fifth because it could be a long night, and I, I'd like <coughs> to be able to allow people to still get home at a decent time. Uh, I've been asking the town council members, at least my advice, uh, everyone really has their own mind. Uh, I don't try and dictate uh, to, to anyone here, uh, but uh, my advice has been to be circumspect uh, in remarks because even though we don't give up our, our civil rights to have opinions, uh, as town officials, uh, it can be taken wrong uh, but uh, uh, in private, people know how I feel. Uh, but that's where it'll stay. I'm not going to change that now. Uh, uh, I do think that social media is a curse uh, uh, and, uh, and undermines civil dialogue. People always seem to think they can say anything they want in, in, in a 140 characters. Yeah some short snippet, uh, it's, uh, it's terrible. Uh, the biggest mistakes lawyers in my law firm ever made was they put something down in a short email that they terribly regretted later. And it just, it's, it's something, pick up the phone and, and call people and talk with them face to face. Uh, uh, we do need to uh, recover. I do think the town will recover. Uh, because uh, I think the town is made up of a lot of good people. When I look at all the citizens who contribute to the committees that we have, hundreds of people, and uh, all the good people who I've met and didn't know before associated with the school department, and the teachers and the principals. Uh, so I have a lot of confidence that we will bounce back. This will be a difficult time in the weeks ahead, uh, and I, I certainly hope we all can gain some greater respect for each other. So with that, further comments? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. It's unanimous. Accept the motion uh, to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. That goes to Will Rowan. Oh, right. Three. Almost.